is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 197, covering the week of December 2nd through December 6, 2019. Glad to have you back in the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Abbeville Institute. Like our Facebook page at Abbeville Institute. And of course, subscribe to our YouTube page at Abbeville Institute. You can find all those social media buttons at our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. Just go to that website. At the top of the page, you'll see all those buttons. Click on those. Take you right out to our social media accounts. While you're there, give us an email address and we'll give you a free ebook. You'll get our Daily Dose of Dixie Monday through Friday and our weekly email on Saturday or Sunday, which includes a link to this podcast. Also, go to your web, or I'm sorry, to your mobile application store, whether it's uh, Google Play, um, iTunes, wherever you get your uh, apps, and download the free Abbeville Institute app. So if you want the Abbeville Institute on the go, just go ahead and download that thing. You get the podcast, you get all of our lectures and mobile access to the website. It's a great way to keep up with the Institute while you've got your mobile device. So again, free of charge, um, you can simply download this thing. Also go to our webpage, abbeyofleinstitute.org, click on that support tab, and you have a button that says shop. Click on that. You can get all of your Abbeville Institute apparel. It's nice, high quality embroidered material. It's not uh, screen printed, so it's good stuff. It'll last a long time. You've got golf shirts, t-shirts, hats, golf towels, fleece jackets. It's getting cold now. Get a fleece jacket uh, so you can stay warm with the Abbeville Institute. And of course, you advertise the Institute while you do that. People look at it and say, hey, what's that Abbeville Institute thing? You can tell them all about it. And of course, we exist on your generous contributions alone. So if you like what we do, if you like this podcast, if you like our website, if you like our conferences, which we are planning now for 2020, we should have uh, three next year, three public conferences at least. Um, that's what the plan is right now. So stay, uh, stay tuned for that. But if you like all the things that we do, please consider a tax-deductible donation to the Institute. It is the end of the year. So if you're making your tax plans... Make a donation to the Institute. You can write it off your taxes. Um, and, of course, it does help support our podcast and all of our activities and our website. And so let me start today with that. This past Tuesday was Giving Tuesday. And uh, it's, a, it's a time when charities, nonprofits, try to uh, encourage people to donate. And it's a nice, nice idea. There are many different charities, many different nonprofits that are worthy of your financial contribution. Uh, many of them do great things for people. And we hope that the Abbeville Institute is one of those things for you. If you're listening to this podcast, you're probably already a true believer in it, or maybe you're just curious about it. But our goal, of course, is to explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. And so we put a lot of time and money into that. Um, what we do is not free. The website is not free. The back end of that is not free. All the things, all the conferences, all the things that we do are not free. And so we have to raise money to do these things. And so I sent out a letter yesterday. And of course, uh, Don Livingston sent one out on Tuesday and Clyde Wilson on Wednesday. I did yesterday. And Ben Jones, Cooter from the Dukes of Hazard, sent one out on Friday. Maybe you got that. Maybe you didn't. But it went to uh, our email list. And my letter asks, what is the Southern tradition worth? Uh, most of us go and we spend uh, you know, money on entertainment. We'll go to the movies, which is great. We actually have a, a piece on movies this week. Or uh, you uh, go out and you buy a Starbucks coffee or something. And, of course, you spend several dollars doing that. And that's wonderful stuff. But what is the Southern tradition actually worth? Is it worth a movie ticket a month or maybe an expensive cup of coffee a month to help preserve this southern tradition that is con I mean, consistently under attack now. It, there's, it's coming from all sides. As one of the book reviews points out this week, it's very clear it's coming from all sides. It's not just coming from the left. It's coming from the right as well. Friends, quote-unquote friends, who disparage the South. So with friends like that, who really needs enemies? So who is speaking up for the South? And of course... That's what we're trying to do here. It's not just about defending monuments or defending soldiers, defending the South against attacks about the war. 
We do those things, but it's also to try to reinvigorate a perspective on America, a Jeffersonian perspective on America that's been ground down by Hamilton's America. And that's whether it's economics, whether it's culturally, whether it's politically, socially. The things we talk about here are the valuable parts about the Southern tradition. What did the South have to say about, say, decentralization, local communities, local economies? We know, for example, the agrarians, which I'm hoping we do a conference on next year. It's the 90th anniversary of I'll Take My Stand. But what did the agrarians have to say about modern American society in 1930 or 1936 when they wrote Who Owns America? It's the same thing Tucker Carlson said a couple of days ago on Fox News, talking about venture capitalists and the forgotten people in America, middle America, not just in the South, but also in the Midwest. Uh, Don Livingston and I were talking yesterday, and he said, you can scratch people in, in various parts, whether it's New England, the Midwest, the Far West, the South, and you're going to find this Jeffersonian underneath. They don't know it, but it's there. And this is what the Southern tradition offers. It's a critique of modern American society, urbanization, industrialization, the fusion of finance, capital, and government, the things that are problematic in America that we all see, but yet we don't know how to put a finger on it. When we had Occupy Wall Street, these people were right that we have a problem with the fusion of government and finance capital, but they didn't know what to do about it. They're just turning to Marxism which is the wrong thing to do, or they're turning to fascism, which is the wrong thing to do. There's an American tradition there. It's a Southern American tradition. It's Jeffersonian. There is an, an American response to these things. It's not fascism or communism. I've said many times that people on both sides are lost souls. They don't know what to do because they don't have connection to this American Jeffersonian tradition that we talk about consistently on this podcast, on our website, the Southern tradition. It's not fascist. It's nowhere near fascist. Southerners were fighting against fascists in large numbers during World War II. Descendants of Confederate heroes were heroes of World War II. It's not fascist at all. It's not communist. Southerners have been ardent anti-communists. What it is, is Jeffersonian. When you look at the critique of finance capital in the Gilded Age, for example, and we talk about the Glass-Steagall Act and following that into the early 20th century, Glass-Steagall Act and the resistance to the Federal Reserve, the Clayton Antitrust Act, these particular bills were authored by Southerners who understood that big government is problematic but it's really problematic when you get big government and big banks and big business together because that creates a big mess for Americans. So that Southern tradition, this is what Tucker Carlson was talking about. It's what we talk about constantly. He doesn't call it the Southern tradition. He, again, he can't put his finger on what it is because we've lost this thing. So these monuments that are being torn down, it's not just about defending Confederate soldiers. It's about defending what they represented, which is defiance to the Yankee Leviathan. It's defiance to unconstitutional government. It's what people recognized and what they'll actually admit if they're honest. And they say, you know what these things represent? They represent dissonance. They do. They represent defiance. Giving the big middle finger to the Yankee monstrosity in Washington, D.C., which is why the Southern tradition is important. It's not just, or the, or the Yankee monstrosity in New York. It's not just about government. It's about banking. It's about industry. The exploitation of workers that the agrarians talked about. It's about independent farmers. A different way of life. Those are the valuable things that the Southern tradition offered. And of course, people will point out, well, but the Southern tradition had all these horrible things. Yeah, okay. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the valuable things in the Southern tradition. What can we learn from it? What can we learn from John Taylor of Caroline? What can we learn from Nathaniel Macon? What can we learn from Thomas Jefferson or George Washington or James Madison or James Monroe? What can we learn from David Crockett or Daniel Boone or Andrew Pickens? What can we learn from them? 
What can we learn from Richard Russell, who was, if he wasn't from Georgia, would have been a presidential candidate? I mean, people are going to, oh my gosh, you just brought Richard Russell. The guy was horrible. Look, I mean, even even people on the left recognize, wait a second here, some of his ideas we like. He was against the Vietnam War, favored uh, some of the policies that would, again, some of these regulatory policies that were targeting big banks and big business. What can we learn from these people? Is it is there something valuable there or not? I mean, can we say Richard Russell's not someone we should we should study or not? These are the things that we talk about on a regular basis. What can we learn from William Faulkner or Robert Rourke, someone we we talk about this week on the, on the website? Or uh, some of the other great Southern authors. What can we learn from these people? Southern filmmakers, Southern musicians. What can we learn from these people about modern American society? What do they have to say? This is what we do on a regular basis at the Institute. And again, these things are not free of charge. For us, they are for you, but they're not for us. So would you be willing to open up your wallet? For a $5 a month contribution or a $10 a month contribution, one movie ticket a month. For all of the free content we provide, hundreds of lectures, thousands of articles, all free of charge. You can read these things, you can listen to these things, and you don't have to pay a dime for it. Or you can say, you know, I use these things on a regular basis. I'll contribute $5 a month or $10 a month. Or if you want to pay one time, I'll give you $100 a year or $50 a year. Of course, if you want to contribute more, that's great. But even the smallest amount helps us continue our mission to explore what's true and valuable in the Southern tradition. And believe me, we punch harder and higher than our resources. And we want to do more. But more takes financial resources. And as Ben Jones pointed out in his letter on Friday, I mean, the other side has so much money and so many resources uh, that it's this is a tough fight. It's a tough fight. And again, with friends who consistently disparage the Southern tradition, who needs enemies? So if you're listening to this podcast, you're already a, someone who's invested in what we do. If you don't contribute, and you can contribute, everyone understands that. But if you can contribute, even $5 a month, consider a $5 a month donation. It will go a long way to helping us continue what we do at the Institute. And uh, it'll help us do things that uh, will fight back against this politically correct assault on the Southern tradition. Because that's really what's going on here. It is if, if Nancy Pelosi can run around saying that Western civilization is at stake in the next election. No. Western civilization is at stake if we don't remember the Southern tradition. Because as Europeans pointed out after the war, the South was the last vestige of real Western civilization in America. That's what H.L. Mencken pointed out, even though he was critical of what he considered to be kind of the backwoods element of the southern of southern culture he loved the aristocratic south so if you like what we do consider a contribution and that's my pitch to you as we get ready to wrap up the year we've got a couple of weeks left at the institute um and uh, then we'll be taking a break for christmas so the last couple of weeks of the or last week of the year and then at first a little bit of, of 2020, we won't have a podcast or any new material on the website. Uh, we are planning some upgrades for the website for next year, so uh, there are some things we understand are not functioning well on the website or not working the way we want them to necessarily work. So we're working on that too. That, again, costs money. These things all cost money to do. So we're trying. We're trying to uh, upgrade some things. We're trying to make some things easier. We're trying to uh, have some programming and other things that would really appeal to a wide variety of people. So if you like all that stuff uh, and you're making your tax plans for 2019, please consider a tax-deductible contribution to the Institute. Again, to the full extent of the law, uh, we are a registered nonprofit organization. So that said, let's talk about the material for the week. 
And we had some really good stuff this week. Uh, and I mentioned the with friends like these who needs enemies. There's a book review that um, by Michael Potts on uh, a book entitled Erasing America, Losing Our Future by Destroying Our Past. It's written by uh, James Robbins. And uh, the title of the review is Dross in the Mists of Wheat. And so Potts says, look, this book has some valuable things to say about politically correct culture, about the social justice culture, the cancel culture, all the things that are problematic in America. And of course, the cover has Robert E. Lee on it. So you pick this up and you think, yeah, this is going to be great. I mean, you've got a, as he points out, um, you have the, the war on Christmas, for example. Um, uh, you've got um, you've got the problem of mass immigration. You've got problems of things in American society that Americans across the United States, not just in the South, but across the United States, look at and say, yeah, these things are problematic. But then he points out, in the introduction, he says, all this is great, but then there's this. He says, the introduction begins on a promising note, correctly stating that the United States has, in effect, become two cultures with opposite worldviews. This is true. But then in the next paragraph, he states, it, the United States, was the country that atoned for slavery with the blood of the fratricidal civil war. He remains consistent with that narrative throughout the book. There are numerous objections to his claim. First, the use of the word atonement implies a kind of blood sacrifice, the kind envisioned in the battle hymn of the Republic. He calls the mind Abraham Lincoln similar language in his second inaugural address. Even if the war between the states was about keeping the institution of slavery, it would not follow that the war was worth the lives of 750,000 people who were killed or died of disease. That is a horrific claim, similar to the left's claim that the country as a whole still needs to atone for slavery via reparations for slavery and tearing down monuments. Potts continues, while Robbins opposes such practices, he undermines his own arguments. Such statements about the war atoning for slavery are absurd, but felt consistently lead to more absurdities. Should all Americans of European descent be killed in a war or die in a plague to atone for the killing of Native Americans? Should Americans be punished for the horrific treatment of the Irish and Chinese that continued as late as the early 20th century? Should Northerners atone for the abuse of workers, including child workers in northern factories? Should Yankee soldiers have atoned via their deaths and some of them raped slaves during Sherman's march to the sea? In addition, who are we to atone? At least in the Christianity in which I was reared, atonement was the work of Christ, fully God, fully man, and could not be accomplished by sinful human beings. This is a good question. Who's going to atone for these things? So, but this is the problem with the, with the right. They buy into this proposition nation. They buy, in, buy into the Lincoln myth. We have an, an, an American Parthenon sitting in Washington, D.C. with Abe Lincoln as Athena, the protector of the city god of Washington. I mean, this is what we have. But, and the right consistently plays this up. So by doing so, as he says, they're undermining their own arguments. They're, they're destroying the Southern tradition. This, this war was worth it. It was worth it how? We can all say that ending slavery was a good thing. But even Lincoln was willing to put that off for five years, at least at the end of the war, if the South had just come back in. Now, I know that a lot of Lincolnites will say, no, 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 he was just blowing smoke. He didn't really believe that. Well, uh, I think Paul Escott has conclusively shown, yeah, he probably did. We know that Phil Magnus has pointed out in his book on colonization that Lincoln believed in colonization right up to the end of the war. And as I think Don Livingston is going to point out in his forthcoming book, the abolitionists believed in it after the war. This is something that they were willing to do. So who are the good guys and the bad guys in all of this? If we want to have good guys and bad guys. If we're going to play the politically correct game, well, who is the good guy and who is the bad guy? It's much more muddled than that. Potts continues, In any case, the causes of the war between the states were multiple, and it was not simply a war about slavery. Southern delegates rejected Lincoln's offer, proposing a constitutional amendment to make slavery permanent. It is true that Southern planters and politicians feared the abolitionists. They had good reason to, given John Brown's attempt at stirring up a slave revolution at Harper's Ferry, Virginia. However, their main concern regarding slavery was allowing citizens in the territories to have the right to vote on whether they would 
have slavery instead of the federal government doing so. They understood they would lose the vote in some of the territories, but they also understood that the Constitution gave states certain rights. With slavery then protected by the U.S. Constitution, Southern supporters of secession believed that the federal government lacked the authority to override the public's right to choose whether or not to accept slavery in a given state or territory. If the federal government exercised excessive power on this point, government most likely would later expand its powers even more over the states. Secessionists believed this was a betrayal of the Constitution and thus of the American Revolution. Their goal was to restore the right of the states against an overarching federal government. This is all true. We can say that this was a wrong... I mean, look, going back on this, I know that the snowflakes... Oh my gosh, you're saying that uh, the slavery is... I mean, this is true. This is all true, right? So... There's nothing that he's saying here is not true. And of course, Potts continues, slavery was the issue at hand regarding expansion of federal rights, and the secession documents of the first group of states to leave the Union reflect that. But there were other issues, such as the tariff, which Southerners saw as an abuse of power to benefit Northern, especially New England and industries. Potts says this is not to justify slavery. It was morally wrong, and the vast majority of defenders of the Southern point of view today recognize that. It is naive of Robbins to oversimplify the causes of the war to a verdict on slavery. Oddly, he is not opposed to secession in principle, although he believes the southern states did not have adequate grounds to secede. How can the Civil War, as he labels it, set a verdict on the right to secede if Robbins is not opposed in principle to the secession of California or parts thereof? Well, I mean, this is a this is an interesting question. It's something that Clyde Wilson's brought. We're going to talk about where, if you have justification to secede. Okay. If you're going to say secession is fine, but we have to talk about justification, I mean, these are two different questions. But again, this is a man who is Robbins, who is saying that all these things are bad, these attack, but he's essentially buying into the less narrative. So if you're going to buy into the less narrative, then they have to come down, you see. Because if you buy into the less narrative and saying these things are morally wrong or evil, well then, shouldn't we eradicate something that's morally wrong or evil? And if these statues represent something that's morally wrong or evil, well, then they should come down. The, the soft argument is saying, well, we should remember our history. No. It's not to say that slavery is not morally wrong or evil, but to say that the war was all about it, you're basically buying into the left's narrative. If that's all these things were about, if it's not just about remembering soldiers and the good things that they represented, which I've done countless times and said, look, I mean, these are what the monuments themselves say. They're put there for. Those are the things that we should remember. Not to buy into the left's narrative on what they actually mean. I mean, that, where do we go from here? So uh, if the monument says this monument is here dedicated to soldiers and sailors, it's dedicated to men who died in defense of their home, it's dedicated to the principle of the original Constitution, federalism, independence, the fathers of America. If these are what these monuments are dedicated to, then that's what they're dedicated to, and not some faux fabricated narrative of the left, which Robbins is essentially buying into. This is problematic. And when you look at what's happening in the South, and you look at, for example, the expansion, and this is the piece on Monday by Boyd Cathy, which is an amazing piece, Steel Creek Church in the airport. When you look into what's happened here, Steel Creek Church is one of the oldest churches in Charlotte. Um, it was founded in 1760. And it's now been purchased by the city of Charlotte, or I should say the airport, the, uh, the Charlotte International Airport. The grave is there. They're talking about bulldozing the church and, of course, paving or maybe relocating the graves to somewhere else. This is, this is essentially a, a, a metaphor for what's happening in the South. They're just going to bulldoze the South and relocate the graves somewhere else. When I was down in... in um, uh, this, this stuff has been done. Um, graves have been moved all the time. Uh, the, for example, in, in, uh, in Pensacola, where you have Fort Pickens, the, the uh, individuals who responsible for building the fort, their their graves were moved to a site near the fort, which is fine. Uh, they were moved from across the bay over to the Santa Rosa Island. Uh, but in this particular case, it's just like in Ireland. I have, I have ancestors buried in Ireland. We don't know where they are. They're just buried under a parking lot because they just took down the gravestones, just paved it over. Who needs these people? Who needs these people? 
But when you look at the people that are born there, uh, were born there and buried there, some of the most important people. Um, it's it's depressing, and this again is a nice metaphor for what's happening for the South. Um, Boyd brings up a, a great poem by Donald Davidson, the Tall Men. This is Rupert of the House of Rupert, famed in history, pondering on his income tax, deducting genealogy. Great grandfather from a loophole, potted Choctaws in the thickest. Rupert, menaced by the Reds, scratched, scratches the Democratic ticket. Rupert, mounting in his car, zooms up to God in Rotary. Grandma Rupert had ten children. Rupert's father begot five. All of Rupert's stocks and bonds are strained to keep one son alive. Democracy of fuddled wench is bought from tousled bed to bed. Bass voices and white vests defile the echoes of great voices dead. He says there are remnants of the old culture that survive a few, but they are fast overtaken by triumphant Yankee culture, which Robert Louis Dabney warned about 140 years ago, the fear that we would, he, as he said, become like our conquerors of 1865. Dabney, the old light Presbyterian divine that he was, declared that his role was like that of Cassandra of Troy, to prophecy and speak truth, but not to be believed until too late. He continues, My mentor Russell Kirk once told me that while we were discussing the Old South, that the changes being inflicted on her from both without and within, that, quote, it is hard to love the gasoline station where the honeysuckle used to grow. Steel, che Steel Creek Church and its cemetery remind us of who we are and who we have been. Despite being passed by and deserted, those gravestones cry out to those who would listen and take heed. Perhaps then, for those who do, our watchword could be, Our life is a hope which is continually converting itself into memory, and memory in turn begets hope. So, again, bulldozing over these gravestones or this church reflects what's going on in the South. As Philip Lee points out, it's something of value. This is the great Robert Rourke from North Carolina, a nice little piece on Robert Rourke. Robert Rourke wrote, if a man does away with his tradition, traditional way of living and throws away his good customs, he had better first make certain that he has something of value to replace them. And the question has to be then, what is what of value is replacing the things that are being taken down? And of course, uh, Lee goes into what's happening with Silent Sam at North Carolina, other colleges across the United States. He says student protesters at the College of the Holy Cross, for example, recently blocked access to a speech by conservative scholar Heather McDonald. Video obtained by the College Fix shows the demonstrators chant for nearly 10 minutes, my oppression is not a delusion, in response to McDonald's signature opinion that American college students are among the most privileged people in the world. My oppression is not a delusion. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is the funniest thing. People that think this way obviously don't have any perspective on global situations. The United States is vastly different. Um, oppression here is nothing. It doesn't exist in reality. Lee asks, when, what can we look forward to when the wicked fantasy system imagined by such deluded whiners is overturned? Will they, with their entitlement mentality, ever announce themselves free from victimhood can anyone imagine social justice warriors ever declaring the war is over? Will UNC's diversity chief officer ever agree that her job is done? It will never happen. And this is true. It is the French Revolution on steroids. It will bulldoze the gravestones, the church, the monuments, because even the defenders of these things, the, the elastic spine defenders, are... Saying, well, I mean, yeah, you've got a point, but we got to keep these things up anyways. 
No, they have no point. Lee says leftists at UNC and elsewhere were offering to replace freedom of speech with censorship and an endless stream of false accusations fueled by rage, envy, and revenge. How many statues of other American heroes must be torn down after the Confederate ones are gone? How much money will convince those who were never slaves to forgive the rest of us for sins we never committed? Will they ever realize that those who imagine themselves to be a perpetual victim can never be happy? But this is the problem of American society. It must take Soviet re-education camps, I think, at the end of the day. And that's become the American university, as Philip Lee points, points out. Re-education. You have to unlearn everything that's biologically part of you or something that you learned from your evil parents who might have taught you tradition or something else. Of course, it used to be there was some good stuff out there in movies. Clyde Wilson's piece is great on this. The Southerner's Movies Guide, which has it's part one of this. There's going to be much, much else in this. But um, And I, I was able to put in some YouTube videos. One of my favorites is The General. This is a funny movie. It's a, it's a 1927 silent film. It is so good. Uh, just hilarious. Anybody would watch this. If you like the Wile E. Coyote and Roadrunner films, which are basically silent films, if you like that, you're going to love The General because it's a chase. It's hilarious. And Buster Keaton is fantastic in the film. And it's good family entertainment, but also good uh, pro-South entertainment. Um. But uh, these films, and as he points out, there's so much in Hollywood that's anti-Southern, and it's, it's good to find films that aren't. And so if you're interested in films that aren't necessarily anti-Southern or aren't anti-Christian or anti-conservative, then uh, he's going to start, he has this nice series on things that are. And then last but not least, we have the piece of the, of the Friday piece, Lee's Brilliance and Sherman's Folly. This is by Aaron Gleason. Aaron Gleason says, look, I, I had actually bought into some things that were anti-Southern. And, uh, but as I started reading more, reading more, I, I realized that this is not true. He's, he's critical. Gleason is critical of Lee in the war and saying that, he says, tactically, Alexander wrote a book about generals, Alexander's destruction, deconstruction of Lee is sound. He was recklessly offensive and made numerous mistakes from a purely theoretical perspective. But that's the problem. Lee wasn't fighting a theoretical war. Lee was fighting a holistic war, and the choices he made impact all of us lost causers down to this day. Gleason says what Lee did on the battlefield was always intentional. He wasn't a fanatic who believed that the South was invincible, and he wasn't a fool who didn't realize how much more dangerous rifles were from smoothbore muskets. He says he was reckless for a reason. He understood the politics and the psychology of the great struggle better than any of, this, any of us could possibly imagine. He understood how razor-thin the chances of success were, and that this, his approach was the only way the South had any chance of emerging victorious. He says, in fact, morale was so great that the Allies were absolutely terrified of what it would be like to invade Europe. And he talks about this in another book. Uh, and um, the same psych psychological rules should apply. They weren't wrong. The closer they got to the lion's den, the fierce of the fighting. So he said, I believe that General Lee understood this. He understood that everything was stacked against the South with one exception. They were fighting for home. And he used that one advantage as much as possible. He says he formed the South into a tribe. Now, I can quibble with this. The South was already a tribe before this in many ways. But, he says, high casualty rates did not destroy Southern resolve. They strengthened it. They knew that they were fighting for hearth and home. They were fighting for something real, whereas the tyrant was fighting for the imaginary eternal union, centralization, and money. The North was not fighting for anything except their tyrant. Lee understood that he needed to simply fight the tyrant to a standstill to win. And since the North had nothing to fight for and the South had everything to fight for, that meant making the battles as bloody as possible. They must be more aggressive than their foe to win. They needed to build 
They needed to be. To build Southern resolve throughout the society, and all eyes were on the Army of Northern Virginia. And the proof is ultimately in the pudding, the lost cause pudding, that is. T.S. Eliot, T.S. Eliot famously said, if we take the wickedest and wisest view of a cause, there is no such thing as a lost cause because there is no such thing as a gain cause. We fight for lost causes because we know that our defeat and dismay may be the preference to our successors. Victory, though that victory itself will be temporary. We fight rather to keep something alive than the ex expectation that it will triumph. This is exactly what the Abbeville Institute does. We fight to keep something alive without the expectation that it will triumph. Gleason says, but most importantly, Lee reminds us that humans are the biggest when they are small, when they realize and embrace that only God is God and none of us truly understands what is coming down the road. As Lee said, it is history that teaches us to hope. And so, I end with that today. That history and the Southern tradition teaches us to hope. Until next time, good day. Mm -hmm.